dirty work. He's a private detective. Devious is his middle name. Said a middle name is Claude, but he doesn't like me to mention that. Delicate work. If you barge in when I'm handing over the cash, your carp will be sushi! Risky work. They think it's attempted murder. They'll try harder. Dirty work. You think you're hard back, don't you? I'll show you a hat. Someone's got to do it. Dirty work. New drama starts in half an hour on BBC One. People don't want to wait for the news. With BBC News 24, however busy you are, you'll never wait more than 15 minutes until the latest headlines. Every hour, there are two weather updates, plus sport and business bulletins. This means you can access the news when it's convenient for you, 24 hours a day. BBC News 24. BBC News, whenever you want it. Sir John Harvey Jones revisits six businesses he gave personal advice to in the past. How are they getting on and could they do better? Troubleshooter on BBC Two now. Now on BBC One, the BBC News with Michael Burke. It's nine o'clock. Rover is being dumped by BMW. The company is being broken up. 50,000 Midlands jobs now depend on this man who's never made a car. The Rover name will die. The Rover workers say they've been betrayed. The Romanians, whose biggest ambition is to come and beg in Britain. And looks like the winner, Cheltenham's £6 million horse. Good evening. BMW is dumping the Rover Group after six years of mounting losses. Thousands of jobs are likely to go. The unions say it's the bleakest day for British manufacturing. This is how Rover is being broken up. The biggest factory at Longbridge in Birmingham is effectively being given away to a city investment firm called Alchemy. They'll scale down operations, continue to make Rover cars, but call themselves MG. The Land Rover business, based at Solihull in the West Midlands, is apparently to be sold. It's said to a big American car company like Ford. That's a real surprise. BMW is keeping the plant at Cowley near Oxford and will make the new Mini there. And BMW is also going to keep the body plant at Swindon. First, Simon Montague on Rover's new owner. Stepping out into the limelight, the man who now has 50,000 motor industry jobs in his hands. How many can he save? We don't know. Um, we hope to be able to save a significant proportion of those people working at Longbridge. Mr. Moulton explained which Rover models the new business would continue making. We will be making 25s, 45s, 75s, MGs and the old Mini. But how would he make it work where BMW had failed? Because we will not be trying to be a mass market, very large volume producer. We will be a medium volume producer with a niche marketing strategy. What will happen to Longbridge? Longbridge will be reduced in size but not closed. Alchemy, based in London's Covent Garden, won't be selling off parts of Rover to the highest bidder. We are not asset strippers. Uh, we actually rather dislike that statement. Um, we are intending to end up with a highly viable, self-standing motor business called the MG Car Company. That reassurance had yet to reach Rover's Longbridge plant near Birmingham, where uncertainty made the mood bleak. It's the, the sad day for every, everybody in uh, Longbridge. What, what have you been told? Uh, we've been told we've been sold. What How do you, do you feel? Absolutely gutted. What do you think of this new company, Alchemy? I haven't got a clue, don't even know who they are. No, no, what can I say? I mean, everybody's coming out now looking for the faces, you know. He says it all, doesn't he? In the Commons, the government said it was disappointed at BMW's decision to sell off most of the loss-making Rover Group. And I hope that Alchemy Partners will recognise that as the new owners of Longbridge, they have a responsibility. A responsibility to a workforce that has been flexible, that has improved productivity, and believes, as I do and the government does, that Longbridge has a viable long-term future. Alchemy's grown rapidly, investing in retailers like fads, restaurants, pubs and hotels. In three years, it's become the UK's second largest venture capital fund. But it's not owned a car maker before and admits it's a gamble. Alchemy won't run Longbridge. New management will be announced soon.
Alchemy was the medieval forerunner of chemistry, the miraculous art of transforming base metals into gold. The tens of thousands who depend on Rover are tonight hoping for that magical touch which has eluded the car maker for decades. Simon Montague, BBC News at Alchemy in London. The decision by BMW to get rid of most of its Rover plants was taken at a board meeting in Munich. From there, our Europe business correspondent, Jonathan Charles. BMW's Munich headquarters are a hive of activity tonight. Senior staff working out the implications of today's shock decision. After six years of struggling to make Rover profitable, BMW is giving up the fight, abandoning its British operations almost entirely. Uh, a brief written statement this afternoon was all that marked the end of an era, the only public comment BMW is so far willing to make. Thousands of jobs are at risk, but the German car maker is refusing to offer any proper explanation. What I can uh, tell them is that we think that it's going to be taken care about their future. But everything else, please read the press release. British Union officials emerge from talks with BMW's management clearly furious. It seems it's not just car production which is being sold off, but the prestigious and profitable Land Rover division as well. The unions are threatening strike action. All in all, it is the biggest betrayal of British industry that has ever taken place in history. And that's why, as unions, we've got no choice. We've got to oppose the proposals, and unless they're changed, we will be in dispute with this company. BMW has lost a fortune because of its link-up with Rover. Since it took over in 1994, BMW has been investing about half a billion pounds a year. But over the same period, Rover has been losing hundreds of millions a heavy drain on its German parent. At BMW's factories, German workers believe their company is now acting for the best. Rover's troubles have been tarnishing BMW's image. The money needed to prop up the loss-making British subsidiary could be invested more profitably in Germany. The final straw for BMW was the high value of the pound, 50% stronger than six years ago. It's impossible for Rover to compete in international markets. The cars are too expensive. With the pound sterling increasing to the Deutschmark, uh, the situation has, was getting worse by the day, and uh, I think they lost hope to get the problem solved within a reasonable time frame. Rover's Munich showroom highlights another reason why BMW took fright. Apart from Land Rover, the existing range appears old-fashioned. Massive investment would soon have been required for new models. But now, gleaming luxury BMWs have proved more attractive. Money invested here virtually guarantees big profits. BMW has had its fingers badly burned. Rover was known here as the bottomless pit. No matter how much money you threw into it, it was never enough. Few at BMW will be sorry to see it go. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Munich. Both Rover and, to a lesser extent, BMW are victims of huge changes in the global car market. Mergers mean fewer companies and give the biggest firms advantages over the smaller ones. It all looked friendly enough in 1994. The man on the left ran British Aerospace, which owned Rover. The shrewdest thing he ever did was sell it to BMW, which thought it needed it to move into the top league of car makers. At the time, BMW was doing very nicely, making luxury cars and good profits. But the market was changing, so only manufacturers who made the full range would thrive. And now, without the full range, BMW is prey to bigger companies. I think this decision shows that BMW is weak. They're not able to stand the losses. They need to have every fennec available to meet the competition around the world. And they now become a very small player without Rover. They're very vulnerable, and I think, as an independent player, BMW day, BMW's days are limited. Once there was the Ford Anglia, a British-designed, British-made car sold only in Britain. Every big European country had its own distinctive cars made by the two big American companies, Ford and General Motors. But tastes now cross boundaries, and the Mondeo, the world car, is the way it goes, made in each continent global taste, global production. Cars demand huge investment in technology for uncertain gains years ahead. So the need to spend big means only firms with large funds can get ahead in mass markets and get the time down from drawing board to forecourt. 
in the short term, it's not that difficult to make money from making cars. The big costs are in the design of the car. So it won't be tonight's bitterness in Birmingham that does for BMW, but the economics of the car industry. Mazda, Jaguar and Volvo got gobbled up by Ford. Can BMW be far behind? Stephen Evans, BBC News. Well, our political editor Robin Oakley joins me now from Westminster. Robin, all this seems to genuinely have come as a complete surprise to the government. Yes, the government's been caught cold, Michael. Ministers have been working closely with BMW, trying to get an aid package approved in Europe. They're astonished at how little they were told. They had to find out for themselves that the BMW company was talking to Alchemy. Uh, BMW didn't uh, tell ministers anything about that. This morning, the Prime Minister's press secretary was confidently saying there'd be no deal today, and they expected BMW, for example, to keep hold of Land Rover. Um, Frank, um, Steve Byers, the Trade Secretary, had talked of disappointment and regret, but really, ministers are spitting blood over this. It's not the 70s now, uh, Robin. How much taxpayers' money is the government uh, willing to risk on saving Longbridge? Well, the days of massive subsidies, uh, as you say, are gone. Uh, the government's role in this will be to talk up the capabilities of the Longbridge uh, workforce uh, and its facilities there, and they will seek to get all the assurances they can from Alchemy about how many cars will continue to be made, what kind of workforce will continue to be employed, and though, although the existing aid package to BMW now dies, there is the possibility of government money if they get the right ass uh, assurances from Alchemy in their talks with them. Robin, thanks a lot. The government's been explaining how it plans to link welfare and work. It's setting up a new agency which will combine large parts of the benefits agency and the employment service. It'll serve 10 million claimants, paying benefits and encouraging people back into jobs. The government says it'll make sure that all people who can work do so. For the unemployed, a revolution that will make you independent. That was the Prime Minister's promise today with a new agency bringing together welfare and work. On a small scale, the new approach is being tried out in the one project here in North London. So, give me an example. What type of work are you really looking for? Francine's advisor will organise training, set up job interviews and deal with her benefits. The aim is to get her off welfare as fast as possible. He asked me about training and my CV, but the main thing is, would you find me a job? As Francine is keen to work, that should be possible. But advisors will also be expected to put pressure on the less cooperative, and the rules are being tightened. There are certain situations where we will have to be a bit more um, tougher in the way we actually deal with clients. But clients are made aware of their obligations regarding to the benefits that they're claiming for. Um, if they're claiming for a job seek allowance, they know they're expected to look for work. And obviously if they're not doing that according to what they've agreed to do, then we will have to take action. Just a few years ago, it would have been unthinkable for a Labour government to link benefits and work in this way. But this is the future, a one-stop shop where the staff who organise the payments also steer their clients towards work. And to receive benefits, everyone must talk jobs. With a million vacancies in the economy, the ministerial message is unequivocal. In the past, people had to go to several different places to get the advice and help they needed. From now on, there will be one door they can go and get the advice and help they need because the government strongly believes that where people can work, they want to work, that they should be working. Easter House in Glasgow, where jobs can be hard to come by. On estates like this, the fear is coercion is coming and that the vulnerable may be dragooned into low-paid jobs, a charge ministers deny. But some of the young and able-bodied who already must accept jobs or training are sceptical too. I think the fact that they're trying to force employment on you that is not suitable and they can throw any wage at you. And if you don't agree, you're going to be flung in the streets anyway. So I think it's absolutely rubbish. If it's to succeed, the new agency will have to be tough with some claimants but sensitive with others for whom work is not a practical option. Achieving that balance will not be easy. Neil Dixon, BBC News, North London. Western governments have been appealing to the oil-producing countries of OPEC not to force oil and petrol prices any higher. Today, the European Central Bank raised interest rates because of worries that high oil prices will lead to inflation. The cost of crude has nearly trebled since OPEC agreed to cut production last year. This time last year, a pact was sealed here in Vienna. 
The oil price was so low that the big producing countries belonging to OPEC, even those notorious for cheating, agreed to a huge cut in output. Oil producers outside OPEC, like Mexico, were also part of the agreement. But now Mexico thinks today's high oil prices are hurting its economy. Its energy minister warned that if OPEC countries failed to pump more oil, Mexico would consider doing so on its own. We think that uh, there should be an increase and uh, we're determined to, in the case of Mexico, uh, we would like to see a consensus, but uh, we're also determined to follow uh, what's best in, uh, for our national interests. OPEC's agreement to cut production had spectacular results. The oil price shot up from a low of less than $10 a barrel in December 98 to a peak of more than $30 a barrel last week. That's added eight pence a litre to the cost of petrol from this Shell refinery in Cheshire. The worry is that this sort of inflation will have to be choked off by higher interest rates and that economic growth will falter. But a recession of the sort caused by similar oil price rises in the 70s is not likely. There's no doubt that an increase in petrol price has an impact on the total economy, but at the same time the economy is much less geared to oil prices than it was, say, in the 70s. Uh, so you see less of an inflationary effect. In 1973, OPEC precipitated an energy crisis in the West by forcing through big price rises. These days, it's more conciliatory. Our main interest, a balanced market that have enough oil to meet the needs of the uh, world econo economy and in the meanwhile give us enough money to uh, develop our economies. Thirty years ago, OPEC stood accused of holding the industrialized world to ransom. Today, it no longer has the power to do that, even if it wanted to. But the decisions taken around this table in ten days' time will affect all our economic fortunes to an extent not seen since the 1970s. Greg Wood, BBC News, at OPEC headquarters in Vienna. Three people are being questioned over the discovery of 500 pounds of explosives outside Belfast. One of them was released from prison under the Good Friday Agreement. Police made the discovery when they stopped two cars. It's being linked to a dissident Republican group. Homemade explosives look harmless, and in this form they are. But this was a huge bomb in transit. Almost certainly, it was intended to murder members of the security forces, and they believe the so-called real IRA was the group involved. As the explosives were put on display, it emerged that one of the three men arrested was a former terrorist prisoner, released early under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement. The RUC stopped two cars on this stretch of road near Hillsborough in County Down. The explosives were in the boot of one of the cars, a security operation clearly well planned and probably based on intelligence information and surveillance. The self-styled real IRA carried out the OMA bombing two years ago. 29 people were murdered. The group declared a ceasefire after the atrocity which shocked the world. Now though, that ceasefire would appear to be over, though the few members of the group have yet to admit it. A major bombing has been prevented and with most Northern Ireland political leaders in Washington discussing the problems in the peace process, the attack was not just intended to murder, but to try and wreck the process itself. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Belfast. The Court of Appeal has cut the record fine imposed on the Milford Haven Port Authority for the Sea Empress oil disaster from £4 million to 750000 more than 72,000 tonnes of crude oil poured into the Milford Haven estuary off the coast of West Wales in 1996 after a mistake by a port official. The judge said the fine threatened to bankrupt the port. The use of electronic tags to monitor offenders is to be extended in England and Wales. The tags will be used to stop them travelling to certain places, as well as enforcing home curfews. The Home Secretary, Jack Straw, said police would also be given the power to test offenders for drugs. The chairman of the trust that runs Alder Hay Hospital in Liverpool has been forced to resign after the hospital admitted it had lost the heart, brain and lungs of a ten-year-old boy who died at the hospital. An inquiry into the removal of organs from 800 children without their parents' consent is already underway. More and more Romanian families are begging for money on Britain's streets. They've been accused of being professional beggars. 
They say they had no choice but to flee wretched poverty at home. Now, in southern Romania, the international outcry against gypsies has stirred up racism against the gypsy population in their own homeland, as Orla Guerin reports. They call him the Spanish one, though he has never been out of Romania. This man is a gypsy millionaire and proud of it. But his gold came from trade, not begging. His home is a castle, but few gypsies live like this. Instead, most dream of better things. Even the children in this village have heard about the good life to be had in Britain. Constanza is just 14 and soon to be married. Her nickname is Anglia, or England, and she told us that's where she's headed. Nine of this family have gone abroad. Nikolaya told us one of his daughters is begging in London with her five children. Here, that is no shame. She went because she heard they were giving the money to live on there. But the money isn't enough, so she begs. She went illegally. She almost drowned with her children. Only God knows how she got there. Most of the Roma people here are dirt poor. And many are not just ready, but able to get out. Borders, it seems, are no obstacle. We were told 80 families have already left this small village for England. Ramon has his passport ready, though he told us he would leave illegally. He said the price to go west was less than 200 pounds. To give his new son Christian a future, he is more than happy to pay it. When you live in a place like this, you have every reason to want to escape. And for many, a life of begging and benefits in Britain is the best escape on offer. This traffic will be hard to stop. And though there is no welcome abroad, the gypsies say leaving is a question of survival. Orla Giran, BBC News, Southern Romania. New guidelines have been announced for the teaching of sex education in England. They emphasise the role of marriage for raising children, but the importance of stable relationships is also acknowledged. The government hopes now to end the standoff with the House of Lords over plans to abolish Section 28, the legislation which bans the promotion of homosexuality in schools. If I get the government telling me I've got to teach about the nature of marriage... Today, ministers told schools in England what youngsters should be taught about sex and relationships. There are key principles which teachers will be expected to stick to in sex education lessons. They include teaching pupils about the importance of marriage for raising children. But they also acknowledge the significance of stable relationships as key building blocks for society. The new guidelines have appeased some of the government's opponents in the House of Lords. The bishops were amongst those who defeated ministers' attempts to scrap Section 28, the law which bans councils from promoting homosexuality in schools. Officially, the bishops have now accepted the guidance, so long as marriage is presented as the ideal for bringing up children. We have to recognise that stable relationships do exist, and therefore marriage and stable relationships within society are, are significant but different, and the difference lies in the relationship to the nurture of children. The guidance also expects pupils to learn about different types of relationships and how to prevent prejudice, statements which have been welcomed by groups campaigning for homosexual rights. There's something for everyone in these guidelines. They stress the need to teach the importance of marriage, but they also acknowledge the significance of stable relationships. Undoubtedly, it's advice born out of compromise. Sue Littlemore, BBC News, London. The Vice President of the Law Society, Kamlesh Baal, has been suspended from its governing council. A highly critical report upheld complaints that she bullied staff and senior personnel. Ms Baal is suing the society, accusing it of racial and sexual discrimination. An American billionaire plans to launch an online university, using the power of the internet to provide free education worldwide. The computer software magnate Michael Saylor announced today that he'd put up $100 million of his own money to start the project. He wants to use cyberspace to broadcast courses and lectures across the globe. 35 years old, worth $13 billion. High-tech genius Michael Saylor 
has the means to turn grand ambition into reality. As of today, I'm committing $100 million for this cyber This 21st century philanthropist is planning a worldwide cyber university open to all and with the world's greatest minds as teachers. Why not actually have all these famous people give the lecture for 40 hours in streaming video and make it available to everybody everywhere for nothing? His admirers call him a visionary, but I wondered, can his plan work? You know, some folks might say, you're a raging egomaniac. This is more about you than it is about your project. What would you say to them? Well, I mean, I, if I wanted to do something with $100 million to feed my ego, I could think of other things to buy with it. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I'm, uh, I am very passionate. I'm passionate because I fanatically believe the world could be better than it is, and it makes me mad that it isn't. And in this particular case, I just like to see education free for everybody. Well, it isn't at Georgetown University, where it costs 70,000 pounds to get a degree. In much of the world, higher education is expensive and requires attendance at a bricks-and-mortar campus. But interactive learning on the Internet may be the future. Once you open up those floodgates to the world, uh, you know, what people usually perceive to be the kind of monopoly on knowledge production or monopoly on, on information that traditionally goes to higher ed, I mean, that's all going to break apart. It already is breaking apart. And that's one of the things that universities find very threatening. American universities are dabbling with Internet tuition. Britain has its open university, where distance learning is well established. But in 25 years, higher education could look very different. America's new generation of high-tech billionaires say they want to use their money to change the world. And if Michael Saylor's global cyber university becomes practical reality, that ambition may be realized. Stephen Sacker, BBC News, Georgetown University. It was Gold Cup Day at Cheltenham, one of racing's biggest events. The winner was the 92 second favourite, Looks Like Trouble. More than £6 million were waged on the race, as Neil Bennett reports from Cheltenham. The pre-race talk and the money was spent on Seymour Business trying to enter the Cheltenham Hall of Fame by winning the Gold Cup two years in a row. It was a gallant attempt as Mick Fitzgerald on Seymour Business tracked Gloria Victis for most of the three miles. But by the time Rinkeree stumbled and nearly unsaddled his rider, Seymour Business was falling back and history no longer beckoned. The race ended for Gloria Victis two fences from home with a nasty fall and the horse later had to be destroyed. It left the Irish hope Florida Pearl to fight it out with looks like trouble on the run-in. The dry, fast conditions were perfect for looks like trouble, and he came home in style to give trainer Noel Chance his second Gold Cup winner. One of the happiest days of my life. I mean, very to, to win this race is every, every jockey's dream, and um, just delighted. It's quite something to train one Gold Cup winner, but two, well, that's special, isn't it? Well, you know, once you have the horse, you can, you know, anyone can do it. But it's nice to do it twice. The Queen Mother presented the famous Gold Cup to the winning owner, Tim Collins. The climax to another three days of memorable national hunt racing. Almost as pleased as the connections of Looks Like Trouble are the bookmakers here at Cheltenham. They were dreading another win for the favourite, and for them, the festival has ended happily. Neil Bennett, BBC News, at Cheltenham. And the main news again tonight, Rover is being dumped by BMW. That's it, that's the latest from the BBC Newsroom this evening. Good night. As LastMinute.com and other internet shows slide, QuestionTime.com is confident its team of comedian Joe Brown, columnist Peter Hitchens, agriculture minister Nick Brown, Tory Theresa May and Lib Dem Matthew Taylor will yield a profit. One investment you mustn't miss. Join us on BBC One, 10.50. Good evening. The chairman of Older Hay Children's Hospital has been sacked. The health minister, Lord Hunt, demanded Frank Taylor's resignation when he learned that the hospital had lost the organs of a baby boy. Our health correspondent, Claire Smith, has the latest development in the scandal over organ retention. The Conlin family planned to hold a second funeral tomorrow to bury the organs of Stephen, who died in 1992 at Older Hay. But last night they were told the hospital has lost and probably destroyed the organs they took without the family's knowledge. I'm very bitter towards the hospital on the organ side. I mean, I know they've saved lives and everything else, but what they've done here 
it's totally, totally wrong. Frank Taylor, Alder Hayes chairman, is the first executive from the hospital to be sacked since the scandal broke last summer. Now Lord Hunt, the health minister, has promised more heads will roll if necessary. I think that the parents concerned have a great deal of sympathy owing to them and I am very distressed at what has happened. I'm determined we get to the bottom of it. Hundreds of parents who've been told the hospital took organs from their dead children are still waiting for the Department of Health inquiry into the matter. Now Lord Hunt has promised the investigation into what happened to Stephen Conlin's organs will be made public too. The operators of the Trafford Centre shopping complex have been fined £100,000 in order to pay legal costs after the death of six-year-old Samuel Adams at the complex 19 months ago. Manchester Crown Court was told the centre had opened to the public before adequate safety management systems had been put in place. Ralph Lunsom reports. On the 10th of October 1998, Samuel Adams went with his parents and cousins to visit the Trafford Centre one month after it officially opened. The six-year-old had been playing on the stage in the Orient dining area. A section of removable barrier stacked at the back of the stage fell on him and Samuel Adams was declared dead at Hope Hospital that evening. The company had already pleaded guilty to failing to ensure the safety of the public under the Health and Safety at Work Act. Today at Manchester Crown Court, a judge described it as a serious breach resulting in the avoidable and unnecessary death of a young child. Outside court, Samuel Adams' parents gave their reaction. £100,000, it may well seem a lot of money to you or I, but to a, a multi-million pound organisation like that, it really is a, a, a fairly trivial amount. The court heard the railing that fell weighed 18 stone and required four people to move it. The prosecution said when the centre opened, no adequate risk assessment had been carried out relating to the barriers and how they would be stored. The man's being questioned by police over the murder of a baby in Cumbria ten years ago. The baby boy's burned remains were found on the Red Hills rubbish tip. This morning, a man in his 50s was arrested at Egremont in West Cumbria. He's been taken to Barrow Police Station, where he's still being questioned. That said, we're back in Breakfast News from 6.25 and CFAX page 160, of course. Here's David Brain with the weather. Good night. Good evening to you. Earlier this week, we had some quite pleasant sunshine and some pretty respectable temperatures as well. Today, we've not been quite so lucky. A lot of cloud has filtered across a large part of the United Kingdom, so we've had a massive range in temperatures. Up in the northeast, the Bournemouth's had temperatures as high as 15 degrees Celsius. The Channel Islands, Jersey, for instance, with the wind off the sea, had no higher than 9. And the cloud that produced the holes that allowed the temperatures to perhaps get up to 15 degrees today is going to fill in again for overnight tonight and cause us problems tomorrow. You can see there's a lot of cloud on our satellite sequence here, and that cloud will be around for much of the night. It'll help hold temperatures up. It'll also be around for a large part of tomorrow as well. So that's our forecast for the overnight period. Perhaps that cloud's thick enough for a little bit of rain, western Scotland, the hills of Northern Ireland, North Wales and the northwest of England. Temperatures in the range of 3 to 6 degrees. I think you'd be very unlucky to see any frost for the overnight period with the amount of cloud we've got right now. High pressure firmly in charge, although it does give some sunshine, but unfortunately at this time of year we do got a lot of cloud trapped underneath that area of high pressure. And a weather system will try to move in from the northwest to add a bit more cloud as we move through into the middle part of the weekend. Winds light and generally quite variable to the south. I think we'll probably see a little bit more wind in the far north, but we're going to have light winds, I think, for the next couple of days with that high pressure so close by. And tomorrow morning, it's going to be a rather dull grey start. Not a great deal of brightness, not a lot of sunshine, perhaps just a little bit trying to get through some of that cloud. Perhaps a better chance to see that sunshine through the afternoon. But more cloud moving into the far northwest of Scotland. That cloud's certainly thick enough to give some outbreaks of rain. Here, we're looking at temperatures at around 10 degrees. Further south, if we do see the holes, maybe 14 or 15, otherwise, typically around about 12 degrees for a large part of the United Kingdom. That's Saturday's forecast. Once the band of cloud moves a little bit further south, there could be some quite nice sunshine in more eastern areas. And as we move into Sunday, more weather fronts moving in from the west means more cloud for some of the more western areas. Have a good evening. Want to know what we're doing in Sydney, Australia? Find out on Saturday. Casualty. Down under. Being a ghost isn't easy. Could I borrow your body for a night, please? There's rigorous training. I haven't quite got the hang of this sticking to things yet. Maintaining your ghostly streak cred. We want you to be a powerful, smart, 
sophisticated ghost about town. And helping your best mate solve mysteries. A bomb? Well, untie me then, Martin. Can't can I am a flaming ghost? Drama to die for. Maybe he's an angel. Randall and Hopkirk, deceased. New drama starts Saturday at 8.55 on BBC One. More new drama from BBC One. It's dirty work with language to match, but Neil Pearson's just the man for the job.